State Representative Lance Gooden, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I want to start off just by, uh, you're here at UT, you're alma mater. I should be saying welcome back. Thank you. Um, talk a little bit about how you got to be a state representative and took this career path at such a young age. You were 27 when you were elected. Talk a little bit of how it started, when you got interested, and why. Well, um, I came to UT uh, in 2001, fall 2001. I started here, I was in the business school and was pursuing a finance degree, and then I seemed to be ahead on some classes and I had taken a government class and was interested in that and realized, okay, if I take a few more semesters, maybe in the summer, I could get a government degree while I'm at it. So I said, why not? So um, through that government uh, career, government um, education work, I uh, learned about this UT intern program at the Capitol. So I interned in the 2003 session and spent a session there at the Capitol, found it interesting decided to come back in the 2005 session and worked full time. So I finished school a semester early. Um, and the plan was to start my, my real job, a normal career, uh, going through the business school route. Uh, but I wanted to do a semester or a session at the legislature as a staffer before I was committed to that career path. And so I did that in 2005, got into insurance after that session. I had a job waiting for me. And they didn't want me to start until June, so it was perfect. I could work the session, finish the session, get into insurance, which I did. And then in 2008, I, I started to have this thought that we could perhaps do better uh, than the way we were doing uh, with respect to our representation from my home county. Grew up in Kaufman County. It's uh, just east of Dallas. And I uh, had this wild occurrence to me that why not run? You can't, you can't uh, get elected if you don't run. The only sure thing is, is that you won't be elected if you don't put your name on the ballot. Uh, so I talked to friends and family, and there were elected officials in my home county that said, Lance, you ought to go for it. We don't think you'll win, but we'll support you anyway and give it a shot. So I, um, not knowing what I was getting into, I put my name on the ballot. I started a campaign. I had no money. I had very little support compared to the incumbents, uh, but we started working hard. We started raising money, knocked on doors for about six months, and the, the stars aligned, so to speak. And I've always said that you can't always plan, plan for things to work out in politics. People say, well, what did you do to get here? Um, I think a lot of it is luck and timing, and we had a lot of luck and good timing on our side. And that was the 2010 cycle, right, when Two, the, there was yes. a lot of turnover? There was a lot of turnover. It was 2010. The big turnover came in the fall, uh, but that particular race was won in the primary. The district I represent is heavy Republican, uh, so it's won or lost in the primary. There was no Democrat in November, and uh, it, it all worked out. So you mentioned that you... Uh, you know, you, you have you know, a, a living, really, mm -hmm. uh, given the way the legislature works. Um, you know, how hard is that to balance? It's tough. Uh, a lot of people think that, like Congress, we're, I'm in Austin all the time. Um, I'm making over $100,000 in my government job, and that's not the case. The legislature, our annual salary is $7,000, $7,200. It's so low that you don't even know the exact number. Um, so everyone has their own uh, career. Um, a lot of cases, members are retired. Um, some are independently wealthy. Some of them, like myself, have normal jobs that we j struggle to take time away from. Um, and it's it's a it's a balancing act. I'm I'm not married and don't have children, so I don't have that additional struggle that a lot of my colleagues have. Um, it's difficult to be away from home, though, no matter what you do, and it certainly gets in the way of of your career, whatever it is. Okay, so you dropped into the session that into the legislature in 2011. A pretty contentious, hard mm -hmm. session. Talk about the experience of what it was like and, and kind of what was going on in that session. Well, two years ago, we had a, a budget shortfall of over $20 billion. Um, people were saying this is going to be a horrible session. But for all of the freshmen, including myself, it was all we knew. So what's a bad session if it's your first? So uh, we had different strings uh, being pulled in different directions. Uh, there were people that were saying you should use rainy day funds uh, to cover the budget shortfall. We had a governor that was planning a run for president. Um, he had not announced it at the time, but we all knew he was going to run. And sure enough, he did in June after that session. Um, so there were a lot of dynamics at play. The Tea Party uh, was just getting really, really powerful. Uh, that was right after the midterm elections in 2010. So the, the Tea Party helped bring in more Republican seats, swing districts um, across the state were no longer swing districts. They were hard Republican districts. And we also had a redistricting session. So 
there were every possible um, difficult scenario we could have imagined took yeah. place in my first session. Other than that, not much going on. Other than that, it's just an, a normal Hanging day. Out. Yeah. Right. So how did so as you now embark on your second session, you're beginning to get a little bit of a taste of a different kind of normal. How mm -hmm. do you compare the mood and, and what's going on now to what was going on last time? Um, I think the mood is is different just in the sense that we've we don't have the numbers that we had. We had 101 Republicans. It was um, a two-thirds majority in the last session, and now we've got 95. So while that may just seem like six seats, we don't we're not able to do business without the Democrats there. Um, and there's less of a sense of um, hard dominance, uh, meaning that we know we're not going to get everything we want just because we show up, which was the case in the last session. Um, so we're, um, we're working on an agenda um, as Republicans uh, that we think is um, what our constituents back home want. The, the budget cuts that we made the last session, a lot of us return home uh, and face the voters and realize that perhaps they weren't all as popular as we thought. Public education was cut, and I didn't, I didn't find many teachers or um, public school supporters back home that were pleased with those cuts. Uh, so this session, I'd like to restore funding to public education, and that's not something I, I said last session. Last session, I voted for cuts. Um, so I think in some cases, uh, there are those of us that have faced the voters in the last two years um, and actually have a, a report card, so to speak, whereas some of these newer freshmen, um, or the freshmen in this class, um, have a different set of, um, a, a different perspective, so to speak. It's interesting uh, to see how the freshmen um, ask the questions that I asked two years ago yeah. and to see their level of comfort um, compared to the level of comfort of my colleagues and myself. A lot of us feel like we were reelected. Um, so we must have been doing something right. Uh, two years ago, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, am I going to be a one-termer? Am I doing this right? Am I, is this something I need to be going to? Is this an event I need to attend? Do I need to knock on doors in this area more than I knocked on them last time? Uh, is this issue important to my district? Um, these are questions that I've had answered. Um, and I think facing the voters the second time is, is really helpful, because the first time, uh, you don't know if, if maybe you're put into office because people were tired of the incumbent, or maybe you, you rode a wave into office. Uh, but I think that first re-election is really important because that's when you get to actually speak to the voters about what you've done. And they're not, they're not going out on a limb saying, well, we hope you'll do this. Um, they're voting for you because of what you've done, and they trust you at that point. I, I want to follow up a little on that education, uh, your comments about education, wanting to restore those cuts, or at least some of them. Um, you did hear in your district that negative feedback on the education cuts. Oh sure, yeah. I, um, I you know, I had the support. There were there were bills last session uh, that the various teacher groups were against, and I was against those bills with them. I was uh, one of not that many Republicans that actually voted against um, some of the um, protections for teachers that have been in place, um, some of the uh, the benefits for retired teachers that I didn't feel needed to be rolled back. Um, and I've, I felt pretty comfortable with my voting record, with the exception of the, of the budget cuts. And I, I, I guess I was thinking, I'm going to go back to my district, and my teachers are going to be for me, and they'll give me a pass on those cuts. Uh, but I had teachers, just yesterday, I had an email from a teacher who was upset with me still over budget cuts. So um, I, I think money matters, and if we're asking our teachers to do more with less, um, then they see that as disingenuous, no matter how you may have voted on another issue. Uh, so I've definitely heard it in my community from parents that want to make sure their schools are, uh, are improving and they have all the resources they need to teachers who are tired of, of being told by the state uh, that they need to do more with less. So in my district, um, I have actively gone around saying it's my intention uh, to support more funding for public schools. I don't think that's a losing issue. Uh, for Republicans, it, sh it certainly shouldn't be. How much do you think that varies across districts? I saw, uh, I guess we can now say, Chairman Pitts this morning at the Trib Live event, mm -hmm. and you know his his response to a similar to the similar line of questioning was to say that really all I'm hearing from administrators in my district is that you know it enabled them to to fire some of the dead weight they needed to fire. Do you think it's there's a lot of variance along districts and that's why some Republicans are kind of holding strong on this? Um, I don't know. I think people um, maybe can take things different ways. I've not had any of my superintendents uh, tell me they were able to fire dead weight. Um, 
the message I get from my superintendents is that they're, um, they're in need of, of more money to continue operations. Um, they've certainly been able to get efficient, and that's been the greatest thing, is that efficiencies have uh, grown in some respects, uh, and certainly they can achieve more, perhaps. Uh, but I think class sizes um, have gone up, and in some cases, based on the people in my district that I talk to, they think we need to spend more money in public education. So I, I'm very comfortable with going back to my Republican primary and saying that I'm pro-public schools. Um, let's talk a little bit more then about the, the kind of news of the day. So we were talking inside baseball earlier. Committee mm -hmm. assignments were handed out in the right. Texas House of Representatives today. If I remember this correctly or my notes are right, you got House Administration, Judiciary, and Civil Jur Jurisprudence, Licensing, and Administrative Procedures. Mm -hmm. um, how are you looking at that? What do you see coming your way, given those assignments? Um, well, it's... This is my comment. I, I think uh, this next session, will, it'll be interesting. Uh, two sessions ago, a lot of folks talked about um, gambling. Are we going to pass a gambling bill um, because we need the money for the budget? The answer was no, we didn't need the money uh, because we were all had all campaign and we're going to balance this thing uh, without touching rainy day funds. We're not going to spend more money on anything. Um, and so there's a push uh, for gambling. I don't know if there'll be any progress uh, this session. I hear mixed reviews. Um, so that's an issue that I'll be curious to see how that goes. Um, with respect to judiciary, um, I think it'll be a great committee. Um, a lot of the comments, uh, or a lot of the questions that come before judiciary uh, are tort reform related. I feel like we've accomplished most of our goals, if not all, on tort reform, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, but I think as a whole, the budget will always be the dominating issue in each session. Um, so going back to public schools and back to essential state services, I think that those always hold uh, the front line. So w where are you, you know you and your district on on gambling issues? And I think it's easy to ask gambling from, from thirty thousand feet. People say, "Are you pro gambling? Are you against gambling?" All you have to do is scratch the surface and see, surface and see that there's about a million variations to right. the issue. Kind of, what's your sense? Is gambling a good sense of revenue? How do you think about the trade-offs in the state? What are your What's your sense of that? Uh, my sense is that gambling is one of those issues that requires a vote by the people. And when I give speeches, um, I have these different, different questions I ask groups of people. And it's back home. It's not here in Austin, because I'm concerned about what folks back home think. Uh, so one of the things I ask is, what's your position on gambling? Uh, and it's kind of mixed. Some people are for it. Some people are against it. My position is I'm not for it or against it. Uh, but like the majority, whether you're for it or against it, um, in my district, everyone um, overwhelmingly says that they're supportive of the people being able to decide one way or the other. Um, and my thinking is, is if you're adamantly pro-gambling, then you should want this vote to come so you can get, get your gambling. If you're against gambling and you truly believe that the people of Texas are against it, then you should want it to come before um, the people for a vote so it can be dead for for good, so we can quit talking about it. So I think it's an issue. Um, people say, well, Lance, didn't we elect you to go down to Austin and make decisions for us? How can you, you can't always defer to the people on uh, difficult issues. But when it comes to gambling, that is one of those issues that requires a vote by the people. It requires an amendment to the Constitution. So it's absolutely something uh, that's truly up to the people of Texas. So I would be supportive of, of either of saying we're going to go this route or we're not, and let's stop talking about it. And just get it in front of folks and, and be done with it. Move it off. Right. Um, what else interests you? What else interests you this session in terms of things you're working on? Um, I have an interesting bill uh, that I'm filing tomorrow. It's um, it's drone legislation. And anytime someone asks me, well, tell me why you're filing this. I feel like I need about 20 minutes with them. Uh, but basically, unmanned aerial vehicles, which are commonly referred to as drones. Are, are cheaper than they used to be. And when people think of drones, they think of Pakistan and Afghanistan and us sending drones uh, by our military and dropping bombs or taking pictures. But here in the US, you can go to a store and buy a $500 drone or a, or a perhaps more expensive drone, and you can send it up over your house. You can send it over your neighbor's house. You can film. You can take pictures. You can do all kinds of things with this drone. And this legislation that uh, I'm going to file tomorrow on Friday basically says that you cannot capture images of someone's private property without their permission. And you also can't use those images. So um, 
an illustration. Let's say I uh, own a business and I want to see what my competitor is up to. I can't send a drone over his property to start filming him 24-7 to see what he's doing. Um, let's say there is a, someone who has criminal intentions, whether it's a thief or a pedophile uh, that wants to send a drone over a neighborhood to kind of see where people are going, what time are people home, what time are they not. The drones uh, that are available, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. You can basically park a drone up in the sky and film 24-7. Uh, law enforcement can also use them to watch us 24-7. Is that something we as a society want? Uh, so this legislation will provide guidance. It'll provide um, uh, a penalty if you basically film or capture images of someone's private property. And then there's another one if you actually use those. So if, if you take pictures, it's one offense. If you put them on the internet, it's another one. And it gives someone a recourse um, if they feel like their privacy has been violated. It also gives guidance to law enforcement requires a search warrant if they're going to just film over your property. We don't want law enforcement uh, doing indiscriminate surveillance at will. So there's several uh, provisions, exclusions. Border security is one, responding to an emergency. Uh, but this is going to be filed on, on Friday. And I believe the Texas Tribune is going to do more of a, a story on it on Monday. So there'll be some, some more information about it. So it sounds like there's a lot to sort out there in terms of protecting privacy versus protecting some freedoms. Some of that seems pretty intuitive. I mean, right. in terms of state surveillance, in terms of people using your images, your property to either commit critical, cr criminal acts or to profit at your expense. Right. Uh, did you have to work much to kind of figure out where those lines were in terms of you yes. know, images of properties? It sounds to me like some provisions of that would make Google Maps illegal. Yeah, Google Maps, for the most part, those are from satellites, but you're not going to be able to control a satellite. Um, but some people say, wasn't well, this the same thing as an airplane or a helicopter hovering over your house? It's, it's airspace. You can't regulate that. The difference is you know if a helicopter or, a, or an airplane is over your house. You can hear it. It's there. It's very expensive to maintain a helicopter. It, it would be cost prohibitive for me to have a helicopter hovering over your house watching your every move. Um, but I can I could afford a drone to sit over your house and me watch you. Or maybe I'm running for office and I'd like to see what my opponent's doing all the time. Um, there's, there's, Are you going to exempt that? Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Oppo re, an oppo research right. exemption? Maybe a grandfather clause. Um, but the, uh, the, different, the different ways that this could be abused um, are, are exponential. and. The basic idea is that we have a, a, an expected right to privacy in our homes. So if you're walking down the street, if I'm walking down the sidewalk and I want to take pictures of your house, it's fine. I'm on a pub public roadway. Uh, but should, be, should I be able to hover over your backyard and go f 10 feet off the ground and peer into your windows um, just because I can afford this piece of equipment? Um, and I think we have support for it today because not everyone has them. Um, law enforcement isn't using, aren't using these drones. Um, all over the place. Five years from now, when they're cheaper, uh, when law enforcement has laid off police and replaced them with drones, when the news media no longer buys helicopters and they just buy drones that can just watch us nonstop, um, then it's going to be harder to pass this bill. I've talked to law enforcement groups that are supportive. The DAs across the state are OK with this legislation. And it's my belief that because we're not all addicted to these drones yet, um, that it's easier to get it passed today. But five or 10 years from now, I think we'd face a lot more um, opposition. To so nip it in the bud. And, and something like that, yes. How did you get interested in this? I'm curious. Um, I had a constituent who had some property, and his neighbor had one of these drones that was going down to check on his cattle. Um, I have a rural district, so, and that makes sense, right? You've got, you've got cows, you want to see is everything OK? So he sent a drone out there, but he'd also go over my constituent's property. And he thought, should, should my neighbor be able to just come over my property and take pictures when my kids are out playing in the swimming pool? Do I really want people taking pictures of my family when they're at home? Do I want people to know my every move? Um, so we just kind of talked about it about a year ago, and it's, it's come together, and we've gotten some really good response. There's some futuristic ranching techniques going on out there. There are, right. Um, <coughs> I want to move on well, you know, to the, uh, I don't think you can talk to anybody about politics right now and not talk about water. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your sense of, uh, talk a little bit about how that's developed. I mean, it seems to me 
you know, if you've watched the inside, I've had people kind of sit in that chair and talk about water for a couple years and nothing's really come together. You think it's just the fact that there's a little, that the fiscal situation isn't as bad that's made the water issue kind of move to the front? I mean, it seems like there's a bidding war, you know, up, you know, in the upward direction to spend more money on water. Every time I go to something, we started at a million, then we got to about a million and a half, and, or a billion. Now we're talking two billion. The governor was talking about 3.67 or 3.6, 3.7 for right. water and transportation. Kind of talk from, the, from what you've seen about how that's happened and what's going on. Uh, I, I think it all started with the drought that we had uh, right after the session. Um, so everyone knows we had a horrible drought. It was, it was horrible in my district. And so that combined with the fact that we're not broke this session uh, is a great recipe uh, for an appetite that actually addresses the water problem. So I think um, it's, it's an easier sell to the voters. Um, the drought is very clearly in the minds of people that I represent. The trees, even the trees are still dying uh, back home. I've, I've got one that's about to fall in my house uh, in my backyard that died during the drought. And a lot of people still, um, it's very fresh in their minds. I think in the rural areas more so uh, than anywhere. But I think the fact that we have, um, we have some money this session um, makes people a bit more inclined to spend it on something like water. Um, the broader discussion and looking at the kind of renewed emphasis on infrastructure and particularly water has circled back to education mm -hmm. and the idea that um, people seem willing to spend money on water and transportation infrastructure but not willing to spend money on education. Does that make sense to you? Is that a fair trade-off? Do, do you think that discussion will wind up Getting more money for education? How do you see that playing out? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's less controversial. Waters is there aren't really competing interests like there are uh, with education. Um, there's different schools of education philosophy um, when it comes to spending money. There's talk about vouchers, uh, charter schools, more money for public schools, less money for public schools. But when it comes to water, it's also something that while everyone wakes up and has water throughout the day, um, you don't really think about water policy it doesn't affect you in right. the sense that education does. It's not something that's been on people's minds. Um, and even this, uh, this water talk that we're having now, uh, the average citizen I don't think really r relates. I mean, few people have actually read the water plan. So there's not much talk you can have about water like you can about education. There's so many competing views, especially in the Republican Party. Because the drought has been going on for a while. Right. Uh, I mean, people were talking about the drought in previous sessions when they were trying to mm -hmm. get some water plans. Um, also this morning at the Trib Live event, there was a little bit of a, I guess it wasn't a discussion between the two chairs, or a difference in the two chairs, but um, Evan Smith raised the notion of a tap fee, which people have been talking about as a way of funding water on an ongoing basis. Um, Senator Williams seemed not too happy with it. Uh, uh, Chairman Pitts seemed to think, or actually, I guess Senator Williams thought it was okay. Senator, State Representative Pitts thought it was going to be hard to get any kind of a fee like that through the House. Yeah, I think fees and taxes are still pretty, pretty much bad words, and uh, I would have a hard time selling that uh, to my voters. And I think it'd be a hard pass in the legislature, on the House side at least. Uh, moving into kind of slightly different area, um, you talked about the, the Tribune covering. Uh, uh, some of your legislation that you've been talking about, a story on the, on the privacy and the, the drone bill. Mm -hmm. um, the Tribune's been doing a, a series of stories on, com, you know, quote unquote conflicts of interest, how legislators balance their kind of business interests, their private lives. We talked earlier about the way that they actually make a living with right. their legislative commitments. How do you how do you read that? How have you negotiated that in the time you've been there in terms of figuring out where the line is between the the experience you have as a professional person mm -hmm. that tells you something about areas that might touch on policy and getting involved in those policy areas? Yeah, it's difficult because we are a part-time legislature and everyone expects us to have our own professional lives, but they also expect there to be no conflict of interest. And there were times last session when I would see uh, people actually up on the microphone on the, in the House advocating for or against something that was so clearly obviously related to their profession. Um, and on the one hand, it looks bad. On the other hand, um, sometimes people say, well, 
in the case of, let's say, a doctor, wouldn't you want a doctor up there talking about medicine? So shouldn't we use the professional knowledge that we have? If we have doctors, don't we want them on the health committees? Or do we want them removing themselves because they have a conflict of interest? Um, if you have an insurance agent that has insurance knowledge, does he get on the insurance committee? Or should he be off the insurance committee because he has a conflict of interest? Um, those are questions that are difficult to answer. and They can be argued either way. Uh, but I think we do have some work to go, to work to do with respect to ethics reform. Um, there's the enforcement. Do we want to enforce petty rules, um, like not spelling something correctly or filing something a day late, um, or do we want to enforce everything uniformly? Uh, I had an ethics complaint um, against my last opponent that has yet to be ruled upon, and that was almost a year ago. Actually, over. Yeah, sure. almost, we're two weeks shy of a year when it was filed. And um, if, if we're not going to enforce things, then why do we have them on the books? So it seems like those are questions that people want answers to this session. So, so maybe there's, there, it is time to kind of revisit the overall framework to clarify right. some of these things. I think so. Um, I always end these things, at least my part of it, with a little bit of discussion of politics. Mm -hmm. You have to forgive me. but. Um, you know, you, you came in in 2010 and you, you referenced the coming in as part of the, kind of the, in a way, the, the cresting of the Tea Party wave. Right. Um, that's a kind of simple description that hides a lot of complexity underneath. It's been pretty contentious inside the Republican Party for right. the last couple of cycles, you know, in large part as a, as a, as a sign of success. It's kind of where the action is, if you will. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, there have been people that have had contentious primaries, a lot of, you know, discussion of outside groups being involved. Do you get the sense that that's quieted down a bit, or what is kind of the state of play of the conversation over the direction of the Republican Party in the state? Um, with respect to quieted down, I certainly didn't think that um, during my last campaign, which ended uh, the Monday the day after Memorial Day last year. I mean, I wasn't thinking on election night. Man, things sure have quieted down. Uh, but since perhaps the last election uh, in November, things have maybe quieted down. The Tea Party as a whole, uh, I think most Republicans agree with, with, with their platform, um, even though there's no official platform. But I think uh, I kind of gauge some of it with the speaker's race. Uh, a lot of folks that were outspoken uh, opponents of Speaker Strauss two years ago some of them even voted against him, were very vocal in their um, support of him this last time around. So is that a sign of the Tea Party's uh, influence waning? I don't know. Um, or is that Speaker Strauss uh, getting more people on board? Perhaps some of both. But the, um, I think the measure in the state uh, with respect to the Tea Party is that they'll, they'll be a force one way or the other, but what are their issues going to be? Um, at first it was it was tax issues. Taxed enough already is what Tea Party stands for. And the, uh, some of the issues have become more social. In my primary, um, my, one of my local Tea Parties, they very obviously weren't just about low taxes. Uh, if, if they were, then they would have supported me wholeheartedly because I was all about low taxes. We didn't raise taxes last session. Uh, but they talk about other issues um, depending on where you are in the state. And I think the Tea Party, depending on where you are in the state or the country, uh, is very helpful to the Republican Party. Uh, in Texas, I think uh, we're obviously doing something right. Uh, on the Republican side, we continue to have big wins. Um, our office holders are all Republican. Perhaps in Wisconsin or Missouri, uh, where the candidates were obviously flawed, the Tea Party, in my belief, perhaps hurt them uh, by electing uh, Senate candidates uh, that obviously blew it for Republicans and delivered wins to uh, to Democrats that otherwise were very vulnerable. So I think it depends on where you are. And, and certainly in some parts of Texas, uh, the Tea Party uh, does better for themselves, uh, depending on th this, the race or the issue. Uh, but to answer your question, I don't think uh, division in the Republican Party in the state of Texas is going away anytime soon. And when you're on top and the only competition is, is your fellow Republicans, then you're going to always have some kind of conflict. There's a part of it that's fueled by kind of the ambition, you know, there's a necessary ambition in the air, you go where the action is. Right. I mean, the, in my county, the, uh, the only game in town is the Republican primary. Um, so the action is certainly not in November. It's in the spring every two years. It's, a, it's an interesting sort of, you know, 
reversion in a sense of the way it was here 30, 40 years ago. Right. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, students, you have a chance to talk to somebody who's done this at, at an age very close to you. So I'd urge you to ask some questions, maybe even process questions. Folks, over here. Hi. Hi. Um, my question relates to the political climate of um, Austin. And I guess I feel like it's been such an interesting experience being an intern, stepping onto Capitol grounds, and feeling mm -hmm. like the political environment. Where, where do you work? Oh, I'm in Bennett Ratliff's office. OK. Um, immediately changes. So I guess I was wondering, um, as someone who divides your time between the district and the Capitol, what is it like um, being making political decisions um, like in a place that is so fundamentally different from like the political climate of Texas as a whole? Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question, I think. Uh, basically, in Austin, we're, while we're obviously clearly divided among party lines on many issues, we all get along pretty much. Um, I've talked to some of my colleagues that have since gone on to Congress in the last six months, and they, they, they hardly ever see uh, some of the other members of Congress from the other party. They don't get along. They don't... Um, they don't work together. Um, so it's different because I go back home and I talk about all the great things we're doing in Austin. And some of the great things we do actually involve all members working together, uh, shockingly. Um, so the people I represent, they don't watch Texas news nonstop. They watch national news. And if you turn on the national news channels, whatever channel it is, the uh, political climate is very contentious. It's very divided in Washington. And while we're, we're pretty split on some issues here in Austin, we all get along pretty well and work together. Um, we aggravate each other fairly often. Uh, but I think it's difficult sometimes to explain uh, to voters uh, that things in Austin are actually different than they are in Washington and that we don't want things in Austin to be like they are in Washington. We all get along even when we, we don't agree and we, we work together for the most part. And I don't think that's the case in Washington. That's a good question. What else? You know, we should also introduce John. Oh, yeah. John is uh, John Stavanoa. He was in, the, in your intern program last session, and John's working full time for me this session and planning to go to law school in the fall. So, a good person to talk to about how to get a job when you start as an intern. Right, right. Well, like you. Yeah, like me. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to thank Representative Gooden for coming then. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Please come Thank you. Thank you. Terrific.